Dune Fellowship Session. This program is sponsored by Radia Research Development and Innovation Authority in a partnership between CAXT and MIT. And it's my utmost pleasure to welcome you all uh, to this remarkable event. Today we gather here to celebrate the spirit of collaboration and knowledge exchange, which is the heart of Ibn Khaldun Fellowship Program. This program serves as a catalyst and platform to nurture exceptional talents, foster groundbreaking research, and pave the way for innovative solutions to promote research, development, and innovation in Saudi Arabia and beyond. So before starting, we commend Ridya for their visionary leadership and their uh, unwavering commitment to driving research, development, and innovation in the kingdom. Their support and strategic initiatives have played a vital role in transforming the nation into a hub of scientific excellence and technological advancement. Also, we would like to express our sincere appreciation to both MIT and CAXT for their invaluable partnership in shaping this fellowship program and empowering the next generation of scholars and researchers. So we encourage you all to actively engage in the discussions, ask questions, and share your own experiences as this session provides a unique opportunity to exchange knowledge, build networks, and establish collaborations. So during this session, we will delve into critical topics surrounding the Ibn Khaldun Fellowship Program presented by various speakers who will share their expertise and insights. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Saud Al-Fadl, the CEO of Academy 32, who will shed the light on Redia and the RDI national priorities. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, I would like to thank all of you for attending this seminar uh, where we will be highlighting some of the main importance about how can we uh, empower a woman in science and technology and in partnership with our colleagues where they came all of the way from Boston today with us from um, MIT. This collaboration have uh, been for a while. Now we have supported more than 45 uh, women in Saudi Arabia and we are hopefully this year we will be accepting five new uh, fellows inshallah with us. And what is the main goal for this program? How can we integrate the best science in the world with the best candidate from Saudi Arabia? And hopefully inshallah soon we will include also the mail for various uh, program in supporting with uh, in partnership with Ridia and also with CAX uh, uh, as you may know now uh, we have gone through a huge transformation uh, journey uh, through the sector with the initiating of uh, research innovation development uh, authority uh, the main target how to build uh, the human capability in Saudi Arabia. And one of that track is the postdoc program. And I think with the past experience of Ibn Khaldun program and the uh, achievement we have uh, gained through the last uh, now more than 14 years or 15 years, and hopefully it will continue with CACs until 2028, inshallah. Uh, we are focusing on the four main priorities for uh, the sector. Uh, industrial uh, development or industrial and petroleum uh, manufacturing. The second is uh, economic of the future, the third sustainability uh, and environment, and the fourth uh, health and uh, wellness. 
CAX Academy just launched recently, and we are going to take you through uh, the journey of uh, what is our main goal with CAX Academy or Academy 32 now, and what is the main goal with it, and uh, how can we support in this particular program and various program, inshallah. And hopefully, it will be very useful information uh, about it, uh, Noha, again, and to give a brief about Academy 32. Thanks. And welcome for joining. Thank you, Dr. Saud. I would like to, to take you into a journey uh, in terms of Academy 32, the vision, the mission, the objectives, the channels through which we can approach these objectives. So first of all, Academy 32 is considered to be a non-for-profit organization and a, an execution arm for uh, our Redia in general so that we can build capabilities in uh, this sector so that they uh, proceed with achieving the national uh, goals in general. So Academy 32, as Dr. Saud said, uh, has been established to contour to contribute to several or to achieving several targets or ambitious targets. First of all, to monitor the national needs in terms of qualified leaders and specialists. Then uh, we're looking for the uh, gaps so that we can solve and uh, bridge the gaps and solve the problems to meet the national needs in this sector. After that, these problems or these gaps can be uh, uh, over, let's say, uh, came through the uh, training, development, enrichment program. So we have several channels to address these problems. And finally, we can contribute to promoting the scientific awareness and innovation culture so that we can also prepare globally competitive citizen. So all in all, we have, let's say, a, a wide range of target audience, including the specialists, the employees in the science and technology, also students who are interested in uh, RDI, also among the target segments, segments in our programs, whether to be or starting from the high school students toward the postdoctoral researchers. So in order to achieve these ambitious targets, we set a vision and a mission so that we can uh, realize all of these targets. First of all, as for the vision, we have uh, the uh, target of developing our budget and impactful national capability in the RDI sector to drive the kingdom's pursuit of leadership and sustainability. And in order to realize this vision, we have a mission to foster a culture of RDI and enhance national capability in alignment with the development plans and the labor market needs. So this mission and vision can be translated into several objectives. The main objectives of Academy 32 is to promote the awareness and disseminate the knowledge so that uh, it can contribute to the scientific advancement and economic development. Also, we have the objective to develop and enhance capabilities so that also these capabilities can meet the national needs. And finally, to invest in building capabilities to achieve the national goals. And in order to also achieve these objectives, we have several uh, or various channels, uh, whether to be scientific activities, training programs, or enrichment programs. As for the scientific activities, it's clear from its name that we uh, have general and specialized activities, uh, whether to be lectures, workshops, seminars, or even conferences. So, uh, 
so that we can achieve the principle also of community partnership and consolidate the culture of innovation and entrepreneurship. All of these activities are provided by expertise of, uh, or experts, sorry, uh, researchers and specialists in the RDI. So as for the training programs, which uh, let's say focus on the hands-on training and technical training in the four more, more RDI priorities, they are actually specialized training programs designed especially to develop and enhance the human capabilities to meet the technical and professional development or needs in accordance with the national priorities that uh, have been mentioned earlier. So these programs also are delivered by esteemed trainers. The trainers uh, who, let's say, uh, provided these programs are TOT certified trainers. So they have the know, they know how and they have the skills on how to deliver a training program to ensure a high quality outcomes. And finally, we have the enrichment programs uh, under which we have uh, a long journeys for multiple, uh, let's say, target segments from leaders to researchers and also for the students. So these programs are designed especially also to foster the uh, enrichment of knowledge and expertise and then to refine all of these through practical application. So these programs actually aim to cultivate specialized and qualified capabilities through strategic partnerships with RDI national and international entities and institutions. One of these programs is the Ibn Khaldun Fellowship Program. So in terms of the programs and partnerships, Academy 32 has established uh, many uh, collaborations and more uh, partnerships with uh, whether to be RDI, national or international uh, entities, in addition of establishing also a long journeys uh, of programs in this sector. So this is the uh, overview of Academy 32 and the RDI uh, priorities. Now the floor is yours if you have any question regarding the RDI national priorities or Academy 32. Any question? Um, yes. My name is Dr. Dahlia. I'm a scientist in molecular endocrinology and stem cell research. I would like to ask, so how do you pick the candidates for the program? Is there is kind of like a long interview or how do you pick the students? Because it's kind of a bit difficult, you know, um, program that you're talking about of educating the students and training them. Um, you need to make sure that they actually committed to what they're going through. So how do you pick the students that are going to be admitted to this program? Amazing. You mean uh, for the high school students' programs, right? I mean, it's... All in all. Is it open only for high school students, or do you actually take in consideration um, undergraduate students, postgraduate students, maybe some researchers, and sometimes clinicians, or people in the clinical field who would like to get what we say a taste of the um, research. So how do you do that? So all of the target segments, first of all, thank you for your question. All of the target uh, segments you have just mentioned are included in our programs. And each program is designed especially to, uh, let's say, tackle 
the uh, needs of this target segment and the uh, objective or let's say the aim behind this program. So actually, yes, there uh, are certain criteria for each program uh, according to which we select and nominate the students and participants. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Maha Mzaini and I'm um, from Ridia. Uh, first, I would, would like to uh, congratulate you. Uh, this is a very great uh, program and initiative. And truly, scientists in the scientist community, they really want these incentives like awards and fellowship and training um, that will um, benefit the scientific community. My question is, um, would these fellowship program um, align with the strategic uh, national priorities? So are there projects, do you work in collaboration with the RDII sector to see which program they should um, um, apply for? Yes, actually, uh, the uh, let's say the national priorities are among the criteria in light of which we select the, uh, let's say, the candidates. Moreover, it's very important for the candidate to have, let's say, a clear vision of the local land escape in terms of the project initiatives so that we can make sure that uh, the candidate can get back to the sector uh, so that also we can, uh, let's say, feed the sector again with the talents. Any more questions? Uh, my name is Dr. Saba and I work at King Faisal Specialist Hospital. Uh, I have a very simple question. It seems like uh, it's very well developed and you have a lot of partners and uh, you have a clear vision, but I'm, I'm wondering about the advertisement of, of those programs because I just asked Wala if we had ever heard about them and actually it's like, um, I don't think maybe we know much more about the programs. Is it because we focus on what we want, like um, Ibn Khaldun Fellowship, or is it because it just announced, for example, once a year when the program is open for the candidates, regardless if it's uh, undergrad or high school students? So is this something that it's well announced that maybe we should spread the word? Or So this is my just my, my friendly comment. <laughs> Thank you very much for your uh, insightful, let's say, comment. Actually, I would uh, answer the, the question simply also. The, uh, let's say, the academy is still under establishment. It hasn't been, let's say, launched yet. Although we have all of these programs in the pipeline. So we're looking forward. We have a promising, let's say, plan to, uh, launch, to launch our uh, academy and then we can uh, reach or let's say uh, advertise the programs uh, to so that we can recruit the candidates suitable for these programs okay so I think it's time to to give a warm welcome to Dr. Ahmed and Nafisa the general manager of the Smart Cities Technology Institute at CAST, CAST. We are excited to hear your insights on RDI international collaboration. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. My name is Ahmed Nafisa. I'm leading the Smart City Institute here at CACS. Also, uh, I'm working as AI uh, advisor for the World Economic Forum with uh, the Center for Fourth Industrial Revolution, which is hosted by CACS here. So I just want to uh, shed the light about what kind of collaboration here we have it, uh, at CACS, especially like I'll give you a couple of examples, MIT, Boeing, and different, uh, different center. So... First of all, uh, I, uh, I just hear the question about uh, the alignment between the RDIA and the national priority for the, the RDIA. Uh, CACs, they already have four segments uh, or four sectors that is purely aligned with the RDIA and national uh, priorities. Uh, so there is uh, there is the proper alignment. Also, most of our strategy is 
is built uh, with the collaboration with the Saudi Division uh, 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 programs. Also, we are working as uh, national labs for the for Saudi Arabia to make sure that our labs we have at CACS more than 100 labs, which can be uh, available for the for the researchers. So, <clears throat> I mean, this is. Uh, um, uh, short list of our uh, for our stakeholders, but what I we want to focus about the CACS partnership. I mean the joint center between CACS and international uh, entities like we have um, uh, CCS with MIT. We have uh, a joint center with Stanford, Boeing to uh, and, uh, to uh, uh, to develop solutions that based on the de uh, decision support system. Also, we have with Michigan. Uh, all these kind of center has been reorganized re, uh, to make sure uh, th there will be alignment with the four national priorities. The first one, which uh, with the, the healthcare sector, uh, we have MIT. Uh, we have done a couple of uh, uh, projects related to the healthcare with Harvard uh, and, and uh, environment and uh, sustainability. We have Berkeley and also we have Oxford. In terms of uh, the the economic the economies of future here I, i'm talking about artificial intelligence smart city smart mobility gaming metaverse uh, uh cyber security and so on so we have mit we have michigan we have uh, uh, berkeley uh for the last sector which is about the energy and the industry we have a couple of joint center so all this all this joint center is actually uh a team between uh, CACs and our partner, we co-develop, we co-work together. I think one of the uh, the most successful story is our partnership with uh, with MIT, which is uh, co-directed by Dr. Kamal. Uh, this is actually uh, it's not updated uh, slide. This is the num it shows the number of graduated uh, employees from uh, the top 20 uh, university worldwide. From MIT, we have more than 27. From Imperial, we have more than 18. From Stanford, we have more than, than uh, three uh, three employees. The total number of employees within the Joint Center more than uh, 190. Also, we, uh, we we publish more than 500 uh, uh, scientific paper and uh, around uh, 69 uh, patents. So, just I, I'll try to focus uh, in uh, like. Um, small scale of, of our interest. So we are focusing on, uh, like, especially for the future, so I'm talking about the smart city, which there is a intersection between uh, the sector within CACS. We are, we are interested in uh, mobility, uh, smart building, lo smart logistics. Dr. Kamal is supporting us actually in many projects related to smart, log the smart logistics, utilities, healthcare. Uh, also now we are we are in a discussion with the uh, uh, G Clinic to, to kick off a new project related to the healthcare, government, tourism, environment, energy, and also the gaming. So uh, those are actually some projects with our uh, uh, partners, some of them from MIT, the other from, uh, from uh, uh, Boeing, uh, the Decision Support uh, uh, Center. So just this is to show you, this is all this kind of a project all, uh, and what I discussed is related mainly to the technology, but also I didn't cover the science, uh, the science part of, uh, of our uh, joint center. So uh, I'm happy to answer any question or maybe uh, at the end of this. Is there any question or? Thank you so much, appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. It's always a pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Kamal uh, from MIT to share his expertise on the innovation ecosystem and provide us with his valuable insights into creating an environment that fosters uh, creativity and collaboration.
Christ's life. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أيها الجمعة الكريم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته Thank you so much for, uh, for having us uh, for this important uh, meeting regarding the Ibn Khaldun uh, fellowship program uh, for Saudi Arabian women as you know we've had this program for, uh, for many years now and it's been uh, I believe very uh, successful and we would like to continue you know working with CAXT you know, for this uh, uh, special program. Uh, so today uh, I wanted to, to speak about this innovation ecosystem. I spoke about this topic a uh, few times already uh, here in the kingdom, and I was asked to uh, talk about it today. So this is maybe a shorter version. Um, <clears throat> so as you know, the uh, innovation, you know, in general has played like a, a crucial role in achieving, you know, many, um, uh, aspects including sustainability uh, development uh, uh, projects and, and goals. Uh, and this is by providing new and creative solutions to many uh, complex and challenges uh, that have faced, uh, uh, you know, many uh, nations and regions. Um, and then if we talk specifically about the uh, innovation uh, driven uh, entrepreneurship uh, that also has uh, contributed significantly um, to the economic uh, prosperity of some uh, nations. And this has provided uh, competitiveness, uh, created jobs, and also led to a uh, higher uh, standard of, um, uh, of living. Um, so many times when we uh, hear uh, about innovation, uh, you know, people think about uh, products and technology. Uh, but in fact, it has maybe much broader uh, aspect to this. So for example, we look at uh, processes. You know, this is how we improve uh, the things uh, and how we do things. Uh, services, for example, uh, uh, dealing uh, and exceeding the expectations of, uh, of customers uh, in terms of the management, the business uh, uh, systems, and also the structures within those organizations. <clears throat> Um, uh, also doing the innovation with the uh, uh, partners and the partnership uh, in general, and also how to add value, you know, in these, uh, in these developments. So these are perhaps, you know, additional aspects to, uh, to the innovation. And, and at MIT, we look at the innovation as an end-to-end -end, uh, process, so meaning that we start from uh, ideas and then you go through those uh, by filtering, uh, developing, funding, uh, clarifying, implementing, all the way to the implementation uh, uh, stage of that. And this is uh, different from creativity, right? So creativity, on the other hand, is the ability to generate ideas, uh, original ideas, uh, uh, maybe valuable ideas and concepts, you know, that are specific to some, uh, to some uh, uh, problems. And, and just to highlight like the impact uh, of innovation uh, uh, driven entrepreneurship, maybe I can cite uh, some of the schools. So uh, MIT and Harvard uh, uh, on the East Coast of the US, uh, Stanford and UC Berkeley um, in the West Coast uh, of the US. And there are other universities around the world like University of Cambridge, um, ETH uh, Zurich, National uh, University of Singapore, uh, and so on. And when you look at these uh, universities in terms of their rank, uh, in general, you know, they don't change much, maybe just by a few points, you know, up and down. And you can see that maybe the, the reason for that is the ecosystem that they have, that have contributed to like a unique culture that they have. 
And when we look at the uh, uh, MIT's entrepreneurs, you know, that have founded, you know, uh, many uh, companies and those if you look at all of that and you see at the uh, economic impact of that it's uh, equivalent to about two trillion dollars per year so that is like around uh, two thousand billion uh, and this is uh, like an amazing thing and to see how like one university can have you know this significant uh, economic uh, impact uh, MIT for example is like less than one uh, square kilometers, right? And then maybe we are around the 20,000 people. So this, the students' uh, body is about 10 to 11,000 uh, students. 60% of them are graduate uh, students. And then you have the faculty, the administration, and then, and then other uh, people within the, within the campus. Uh, but then you see the small space, a small number of people but then has like a very amazing uh, impact. And just to see, uh, to compare like with, uh, with the country. So on the slide, you have a few, uh, the GDPs or the gross uh, domestic product. Uh, this is from 2022. Um, so like, for example, India and the UK and France uh, have a GDP of about 2.6 uh, trillion. Uh, Canada and South Korea, about 1.6 each, right? And then Brazil and Russia, each one of them about 1.4 uh, trillion. So then you can say, you know, perhaps like one uh, university can have the economic impact that is more than that or equivalent to one of these, uh, win one of these countries. Um, so, uh, and then perhaps adding another concrete, uh, you know, example uh, is the um, uh, impressive uh, biotech hub uh, in Boston. And so this... Uh, uh, biotech uh, industry, you know, has diverse and also uh, aspect and encompasses like a wide range uh, of areas, you know, from genetic engineering and genomics, uh, which are significant components, you know, of this, uh, of this industry. Uh, but they are also uh, not the only ones, right? Uh, uh, looking at a, uh, a comprehensive, in fact, approach to the uh, life sciences, uh, which includes uh, biopharmaceuticals, uh, medical devices, and also research in many, you know, other uh, areas. But when we look a few uh, centuries ago, uh, Boston was not a biotech uh, uh, hub in the world, but it was uh, a bean town, right? So a bean town that is, uh, at that time, there was a favorable uh, climate and there was also the soil conditions for that uh, and made it ideal you know, location for growing uh, beans and having the, the a hub actually for beans. And this is what Boston uh, used to be in terms of not only uh, cultiva cultivating, but also for the trade. Um, and so uh, the uh, innovative aspect uh, through that was to transform, in fact, the original uh, Native American recipe uh, for this uh, uh, baked beans that they used to have, you know, at, the, at that time. And in fact, the Native Americans that provided, you know, this recipe to the settlers when they came to the U.S. And it introduced a few things. One is uh, going from the use of uh, maple syrup as a sweetener to molasses uh, at that time. Um, and then, and this was more because of the um, uh, a thriving sugar trade that was happening in the Boston area and uh, at that time uh, and also maybe changed or added maybe uh, spices to this so uh, mustard for example was added to enhance like a flavor in this and then also the process which is like the slow cooking uh, uh, and this is uh, mainly due to uh, or having like the uh, uh, beans and the dish like absorbing uh, the flavors of the molasses and also the spices and and so on and then the most important one uh, was actually the adaptation, you know, how to transform, you know, this dish and change it like over some time so that it adapts to the uh, regional uh, uh, preferences. Uh, so when we look at this, you know, you can see it, that it didn't happen like in a short amount of time, but over some period of time. And then this is like a, uh, a, 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 a to me, like an innovation or a transformation that had different aspects uh, uh, to it. And then in the end, this baked bean um, uh, dish or recipe happened to be become like part of the American uh, culinary heritage uh, uh, in that way. 
Um, and so, uh, but then going back from this, uh, uh, the, the, the bean, uh, bean town, right, to the gene town, right, and genomics. So this also had a, like a longer uh, plan, all right? It started like in the 70s uh, where the decision by uh, Cambridge, where MIT and Harvard are, uh, the City Council of Cambridge, you know, to allow uh, DNA experimentation at that time. And then, so this one allowed for many companies like Biogen and others, you know, to focus on genetic engineering, you know, and set up shop uh, in, uh, in Boston. And of course, the uh, hospitals that are in the uh, area, the Mass General Hospital, Dana-Farber uh, uh, Cancer Institute, the Brigham and Women's Hospitals and others, right? Um, when you look at Boston, just within maybe 40 kilometers or so, you find also many universities, maybe 40 or, or more uh, of them. Um, and then the uh, uh, ability to attract, you know, the funds, uh, not only from these uh, hospitals, these other organizations, and also the VCs, in terms of some maybe billions of dollars to set up, uh, you know, this hub over this time. The other aspect or element that played the uh, key role is the incubators and the accelerators, more than 46 of them, you know, very, very successful. And then from the 70s till today, so this all of it led to this uh, world uh, top biotech hub uh, in Boston with more than a thousand, uh, thousand companies. Um, so, uh, so then when you look just at this hub in the biotech, Tech, you know, it has all of these other uh, features, like the employment, like, you know, uh, increasing with people uh, in this area. Uh, the funding, uh, for example, from NIH, which is the National Institute of Health in the U.S., about 10 percent of it, you know, comes to the Boston area. And also the, the venture capital investments, uh, more than a quarter of the whole United States come to this, uh, to this hub. So this, this is very, very you know, impressive. And then you look at the uh, salaries and wages, uh, more than $21 billion. So, uh, so this is when we talk about these kinds of um, uh, big objectives, you know, we think of things, uh, things like these, right? Uh, and then the question becomes, you know, how do we do this? Thing? How do we have an innovation uh, a driven entrepreneurship, you know, thrive in this way? So uh, what I'd like to do is maybe very quickly uh, go through some uh, elements and maybe not in too much uh, details, but just emphasizing, you know, the importance of these. So uh, the slide lists like six of them, uh, the entrepreneurs themselves, and then the skilled workforce, uh, the strong science and technology uh, aspect, uh, the, uh, the financial, the companies, uh, the support from the government and then general support, right? So the entrepreneurs, uh, so this one, uh, I mean, even at MIT or any one of these uh, uh, schools that we mentioned, not any, not everyone there, you know, is suited to be an entrepreneur, right? Because the entrepreneurs have some special, sifat uh, has very special characteristics and so on. And so uh, how do we uh, build this, the, this type of people? Uh, and I believe that this does, should not just happen at the universities. In any place where there is a research of some type going on, then we should have these activities within them, whether they are hospitals, government ministries, uh, research and development centers, and, and so on. Um, so uh, for the entrepreneurship, of course, there are some standard uh, programs, you know, for that. But the one that I want to maybe emphasize is at the bottom of the slide is in developing first the, these individuals. So there are some individuals that have these characteristics already and you don't, we don't need to, uh, to train them uh, in that aspect or maybe just like a small uh, adjustments. Uh, but then there are other people or individuals, you know, that have the, the, these, uh, uh, the potential, and then to uh, build them to to this higher level, and then you look at the few things. For example, the percent personality, the motivation, the uh, cognitive capability of the person, um, and then you go to the teams, the small teams, also those ones in terms of the uh, the culture, um, the the structure, the leadership style, um, the the strategy with them, 
and then you go to the organization in the end. So, uh, so all of this has to be done in a certain way so that it ends up like a, um, uh, a set of uh, gears, you know, all like moving, uh, moving together. Um, <clears throat> and then the access to a skilled workforce, and we just heard from uh, Ms. Noha and uh, uh, Dr. Saud about the Academy 32 and focusing more and more on the human uh, resource, which plays a very an important role in this. And then this uh, skilled uh, workforce, not only from the uh, technical expertise, the business, and other uh, other aspects that are that need to be part of this um, uh, uh, workforce. When we started working with uh, Singapore uh, in the late uh, 90s, uh, we meaning uh, MIT and Singapore, and Singapore at that time was doing the, going through the, like, the transition or starting the transition to an economy that is based on, uh, uh, on knowledge or knowledge-based uh, economy. So one of the programs was the, uh, what Singapore called the Manpower 21. Okay, and this one was a huge uh, program, and this is also in developing the Singaporeans to have like a uh, competitive uh, workforce, new skills, new ways of thinking, the digital uh, aspect of uh, and, and technologies. Um, and you can see that when, if you compare the, the, the GDP or per capita in this case, you know, of Singapore that moved maybe almost three times from the late 90s to like 2021 20, or so. Um, <clears throat> Uh, then, if we look at any one of these organizations, like for example, the universities, the ecosystem inside the university has to be a certain way. Uh, I listed, you know, on this slide, uh, a few, a few, call them maybe major activities, right? And each bubble, if you open it up, there are many, many activities and, and things going on in it that are all kind of synchronized in some way. Uh, if we look at just one of them, let's say this red bubble here, about the uh, centers. Uh, so there are so many of them. So these ones, uh, maybe 16s or so, uh, huge centers focusing on the entrepreneurship, the mentorship, uh, technological innovation, and so on. Uh, maybe mention, uh, and then in addition to these centers, there are also uh, other hubs within this. So like, for example, the MIT uh, Energy Initiative uh, Hub. <clears throat> So maybe speaking about a couple of these, uh, so the sandbox to me has like one, you know, many features. One of them is imagine you have like one student <clears throat> with a great idea, innovative idea to solve some important problem. Imagine that you create a specific program for that one student and having a mentorship and funding and everything around that one student and then you move with, uh, with him or her until they succeed, you know, into that uh, into that idea. So this is one of the things that they do in the sandbox. Uh, the next one is in this this the Spandi Center. <clears throat> so this is in um, uh, uh, looking at developing, you know, innovations, you know, uh, you know, to uh, and, and technologies, you know, to market, whether they are products or, or, or companies. One of the key things here is that these, these centers have between 20 or more than 40 people that are running a center like this one. So, so this one here has more than 40 of them. These are all mentors. These are CEOs, entrepreneurs, serial entrepreneurs, uh, strategy advisors, managing directors, consultants, uh, VCs and so on. So people with many, many years of experience that are running a center like this one. So then you can see how, why, you know, these kind of uh, uh, centers uh, and, and activities when they are all together, that they have a, a very high chance of, of succeeding. Um, and so this particular center empowers, you know, these um, most talented researchers, you know, to develop and bring this innovation uh, and technologies to, as I said, to the market as either products or other uh, companies. Uh, maybe one more uh, of these uh, centers, this is the MIT engine. So this one is another uh, center with, uh, I think, more than 42 people that are running this, uh, this uh, center. And what it does, it does a few things. One is to fund and invest in these innovative uh, solutions and focusing more on the speed. So you get from 
you know, from the time, you know, you start this activity, you know, to, uh, uh, to have it, you know, move to the, uh, the commercial side, you know, to, uh, in, a, in a fast way. Uh, so providing the infrastructure more than maybe 17,000 or so uh, square meters uh, in terms of equipment, tools, space, and infrastructure, and also the building the network, you know, between the founders, the startups, uh, the uh, uh, corporate partners, policy makers, uh, investors, and so on. So it has this, uh, so you can see that each one of these centers has some specific things that they are doing, but then they are connected also uh, with, each, uh, with each other. Um, in, in the MIT Singapore uh, partnership, uh, one of these uh, activities was to replicate, you know, one of the, you know, the entrepreneurship in Singapore. This was the, called the SMART, the MIT Singapore SMART Innovation uh, Center. And then over maybe just a few years, there were maybe 54 companies that were launched and then about more than a billion dollars, you know, for this uh, portfolio. Um, so when you step back and then you think about maybe some of the key things um, in this uh, MIT entrepreneurship uh, education aspect. So this one has maybe three things. Uh, the first one is uh, emphasizing the, the, the mind, the hands. Uh, mind is the analytical side, the hands is all the practical uh, aspect. And then recently we've added the heart to this uh, in terms of having maybe uh, compassion and so on for others. Uh, and the second one is the team-based uh, approach to problem solving. And then the third one is the multidisciplinary and, and complementary um, uh, teams, right? So, uh, and by the way, you will see this in the research, you'll see it in the, in the classes when we do uh, projects, for example. So they have combinations of these so that the students from with the time they start, that they are also, um, uh, you know, themselves active into these, uh, this form of thinking or approach. Uh, the second one is this, uh, the, the, the strong science and technology organizations. So what we mean by strong research, uh, a combination of these, like the basic research or fundamental research, the applied, the translational research, the interdisciplinary research. Um, and the technology. So this is what we mean by having a very strong um, uh, science and technology uh, programs. Um, third one is like the companies, okay? So meaning that whatever we have these, uh, for example, at the university, then we need to have the companies like nearby, okay? The distance also the proximity plays an important, uh, an important role. And then when we say companies, again, they're all different types, like the startup, the medium size, the uh, multinationals uh, and so on. Um, <clears throat> at MIT, there is a, uh, the MIT Corporate Relations uh, Office. So this one has 40 some officers there that deal with the uh, you know, communication with, uh, with, with the companies. Um, and again, here, the, the people that are assigned, they are not administrators. I mean, administration plays an important role. But for this, these particular positions, these people come from that industry or those industries. So for example, the, the, the person or per persons that are, uh, let's say, leading the energy sector, right? So they have a doctoral degree and they have worked for many years uh, at maybe Total or uh, ExxonMobil or Schlumberger, you know, one of the companies and maybe 20 years, 25, 30 years. And then, so when they communicate and talk to these companies, they are coming actually from that sector. They know the language, they know the problems. Maybe they know, they know it better than the people working there. And this is key to this, uh, to have these kinds of relationships and so on um, uh, more uh, uh, effective in this way. Um, when we talk about finance, people think about funding from the government, you know, venture capital, angel investors, and so on. So these are maybe the conventional ways, but, but if let's say Riyadh or, or uh, a city or a region you, that you want to be like a hub for this innovation and uh, developments and so on, so you really maybe want to target it to be a hub. Singapore, for example, for many years, 
you know, works very hard to make, make a financial hub, you know, in, uh, in Singapore. And the financial hub has more than this, you know, the, the fi financing aspect that is the, the basic one uh, in dealing with the asset management, the trade uh, and, and other things. And in the end, having an advanced um, uh, financial system uh, within this. So, uh, so this is maybe a little bit about the financial, uh, financial hub. Uh, supportive government, uh, and by the way, I think here in Saudi, I mean, especially in the recent years, many of these things are happening, which is actually great, uh, great to see. Um, so, uh, but then in the general support, I listed here uh, maybe uh, four or so uh, items. Uh, so the ability of, of to attract, you know, this one has also many things in it, right? Uh, even the environment, right? Whether it's within, uh, like for example, we are in the building of Caxt, like whether we are inside or you walk outside, uh, and then what you see, what you feel. So all of that is very, very important in attracting, you know, not only the talent, but also other people or companies or organizations that we're collaborating uh, with. Uh, and building in just in this aspect of ability to attract, you know, the image, the reputation, the critical mass, uh, the skilled workforce, and all of that can fit into this, uh, into this aspect. Um, <clears throat> um, the, uh, in terms of like the incubators and accelerators and so on also fall into, at least I put them into this general support uh, aspect with the, with the spaces and so on. Um, so, uh, so when we put like all of these uh, together, Right, so you would have maybe something that looks like this, right? So you have like, for example, uh, if we take a university would be, let's say over here and it has all of this ecosystem inside and then all around it, you know, other things that are connected and they work, you know, somehow uh, together. So this is very, very important. Uh, and, and, and the places where these kinds of things have worked, you know, they are planned planned and operated, you know, meaning that it's not like things that are happening by themselves uh, in, in some way. Um, so uh, at MIT or around MIT, we have a lot of these uh, companies, just a few minutes, uh, you know, walk uh, from there, you will see like Apple and Google, uh, Amazon, uh, not far from there. Yeah, um, so uh, the talking about you know, the, the environment, uh, MIT spent like maybe about maybe $2 billion, you know, to, um, uh, uh, this is all as an investment for the uh, Candle Square, which is like around uh, uh, MIT. And this is all, you know, to make um, MIT like a, uh, a destination uh, and to also attract even more the talent and the ideas um, and so that you can have like an engagement that is happening like uh, uh, all the time. And so, uh, so the main point here is that this ecosystem, if we don't have it, if we don't have a proper ecosystem, you know, then we may have the individuals, the teams, the infrastructure and all that, but then we might not uh, be exploiting them in an effective, uh, in effective way. Uh, so for those who have not visited and come to Boston, so we invite you to come and, uh, and visit. And the ones who have visited and have been with us, you know, please come back again. Yeah, uh, we look forward to having you there. Yeah, and so, um, so in the end, you know, as I just mentioned that we can have all of these uh, elements, uh, but what I found out, you know, in, in many places that that have either all of these items or maybe uh, most of them, but still uh, failed, you know, uh, when you look at those, it happens to be maybe from the administration side, right? The administration somehow is not, you know, doing uh, maybe not the right people or the way it's operating is not the right way. And then it becomes maybe not, uh, uh, not effective uh, in the end. And so, with this, I'd like to thank you for listening and uh, I'll try to also answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, yeah.
Yeah, please, uh, Doctor. Yeah, there is a microphone coming to you. Uh, I have two comments, Doctor. I like very much the slides of the ecosystem, and it's very inspiring. And uh, I know that with great leaders, we have those days working to reshape the kingdom. I promise you we will have the same slide for Saudi Arabia, inshallah, because it's really, it's really inspiring, the slide. So I told, I told Wala, like, uh, the slide is very great that summarizes everything and how the ecosystem works. And my second comment, if we, when can we go back again? You mentioned that, so. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I mentioned that, uh, you know, Dr. Munir and Cax, you know, have uh, uh, allowed like the extension, you know, of, uh, uh, of the, uh, you know, the period of the visit, uh, you know, to MIT to up to two years, you know, for some people. But then, as I said, you know, all of you are invited, you know, to come and visit with us. Uh, so when you would like to come, just uh, talk to me. And then, of course, uh, Dorothy and Teresa are here. And they can also uh, facilitate that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Professor Kamal, thank you very much. Thank you. For this very insightful. It's always great to hear you and learn from you every time. Um, my question is about um, I've seen that you have mentioned several times that you uh, recruit great ideas and then you support them, whether it was on the level of individual student or uh, group of people. Um, I've learned at MIT as well, it's very important to spend a lot of time on defining the right challenge. Can you speak a little bit about this balance of uh, whether to find the great idea first or uh, to, to invest a lot in finding the right challenge? And theoretically speaking, just a framework, how to define a good idea that is worth uh, supporting? Mm -hmm. yeah. In healthcare, um, the model that I've, I'm using is really to put your hands on the problem, break it down and build it up in a better way. And this is something I've learned again from MIT Hacking Medicine. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a question that I always receive and it would be great to hear your uh, yeah. opinion. About yeah, thank that. you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Shofana. Uh, yeah, of course, this is a very important uh, point that you are uh, raising, you know, in terms of uh, uh, like working and training with, uh, you know, different uh, uh, people uh, 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 and then you know having them get to the point where they do these things you know on uh, on their own so uh, of course the uh, uh, as you mentioned you know identifying you know where the challenge is so so one way what can do this is uh, let's say to look at the problem you know whatever that problem is and then and then that will have different aspects to it or or elements that need to be done okay this may be like one approach right then from all those elements that need to be done to reach to achieve you know that uh, objective or solving that problem so among them there, there may be maybe like one or two where the investments should be Okay, uh, meaning that that's where maybe the new ideas will come. Uh, that's where the new knowledge, the new science, you know, uh, has a potential of it. And then everything else, you know, can be borrowed, you know, from maybe other people, solutions, uh, things that exist on the market. You know, there's no point in, in re redoing those. So then basically, if I rephrase this one, is on how to take the problem or the objective, break it down into the it's a fundamental uh, element and then identifying you know which one to invest in when i say invest you know we mean like the money the effort and that there is, there will be there some um a new idea that we can build on and do the innovation and so on and of course there are some times where you talk to people let's say in a company or a potential sponsor or something and then they have some objective and so on and then you look at it and then you find out that all of that uh, 
you know, does not include anything. There isn't, there is work to do, but in the end, it will be maybe like a small increment, right? And then, so this kind of work can be done maybe by some other people uh, and maybe places like MIT and so on, maybe not uh, to get engaged in, uh, in an activity like that, yeah. Thank you yeah, you're welcome, thank you, thank you, yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Rayan Al-Mashadi. Uh, first of all, I really wanted to thank you for the presentation. I was very excited uh, when I found out it's going to be about innovation because actually I have a little bit of experience. Uh, I have my own club in my school, uh, the, the Riyadh Schools Innovation Club, and we like to make it as like interactive as possible uh, by giving students like the opportunity to like, I don't know if you've heard of Shark Tank, but it's like basically where you present uh, business ideas. And so I like to make it as interactive as possible for them. And we've covered a framework, which is design thinking, as uh, my mother has recommended me that framework. Uh, but uh, I wanted to ask you if you had any frameworks which you would recommend uh, in relation to like creating ideas for new businesses, et cetera, which I could maybe possibly teach them in the club. And thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you, Ryan. The important question here. Yeah, I think this is what, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, people also have been working on uh, maybe some uh, uh, platforms or uh, uh, or ways of uh, uh, identifying, you know, where to, uh, let's say, where to move in a sense. So, for example, the, uh, the people in finance, and, and when we spoke earlier, you mentioned that you have some interest in finance. So, in the finance uh, area, so some time ago, I don't know whether they still do that or not. So... So they look at what they call the market movers, right? So then when you look at the whole market, there are maybe some um, actors within that system, you know, that are moving in a sense the market and they do like the big things. So, so some people would look into that and then what their moves are and then they try to take that information and then make, you know, maybe like a, an uh, intelligent, uh, uh, intelligent uh, uh, proposal or, or, or an intelligent uh, move to themselves from that. And it could be something similar in, uh, in other ones. Um, yeah, I mean, even in design, you know, we have uh, worked in the past, you know, about uh, methods, you know, where we take like the primitives, uh, like elements in design, and then you have algorithms and, and, and uh, approaches that can combine not only the hardware side, but also the, the, uh, uh, the controls and instrumentation, and then all together combine so that we create, in fact, uh, uh, like a library of designs, right? Uh, and, then, uh, and then from those, we pick the ones that match, you know, like the design required, the, let's say the uh, uh, performance requirements, you know, the controls, you know, these kinds, of, so that all in an integrated, um, uh, an integrated way. Uh, so anyway, so what I'm saying is that what you're asking is an important uh, question. I'd be happy to speak some more with you, uh, perhaps after this session. Yeah. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Kemal, for this uh, enlightening talk. And actually, uh, now we would like to also extend our uh, warm welcome to Dr. Wada, uh, who's going to take us into uh, her journey in the Ibn Khaldun Fellowship Program.
Assalamu alaikum everyone. Thank you for having me here today and giving me the opportunity to talk about a little bit about my research and also mainly about my experience as an Ibn Khaldun fellow at MIT. Um, I know this is kind of a long affiliation, but you can blame my PI on it because he's just affiliated with a lot of institutes at, uh, at MIT and in the Boston area, which is great for me as I'll explain in a, in a short while. So I was, talk, I was told to talk about how I found out about the Ibn Khaldun Fellowship and how I applied. And it was really funny. Um, as, I, as I was talking with Sliba, um, I hadn't heard about the Ibn Khaldun Fellowship before um, because I'm not sure either I wasn't aware of the programs that CACs were having. But anyway, uh, one day I was going to my grad school in, uh, in Texas. And I got this WhatsApp message from my mother. <laughs> she saw this advertisement um, about Dr. Marak Thaqafi's talk in one of the WhatsApp groups. And she asked me, do you know about this fellowship? And I told her no. <laughs> but I'll check it out as soon as I get to the lab. And which was great. And as you can see, the date was November 2020. Um, so I applied and I got accepted. But then, because of COVID, they canceled my cohort for that year. <laughs> but because of the fellowship, it still made me apply, which made me look for advisors at MIT. And usually when someone would tell me MIT, I would just think engineering or chemical engineering. And my background is biology. Um, but because of you know learning about the fellowship, I went and I looked at all the different faculty and I found a huge number of amazing faculty that work in my field. And I had already talked to them asking for a postdoc and they said, okay. So even after um, this little hiccup, the PI told me, we still accept you even if you're not on a fellowship. So I got accepted into the Shalik lab, and this is my profile page on that lab. Um, and then a year later, Ibn Khaldun fellowship resumed, and I was able to formally join. So working at the Shalik lab at MIT has been a very eye-opening experience. I also feel very spoiled because my PI, as I mentioned, is affiliated with MIT, but he's also affiliated with Harvard, and he's also affiliated with the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard, and also the Reagan Institute of MGH, MIT, and Harvard. This just translated to me doing a lot of mandatory training sessions for the first three months, but it also allowed me to use all of the resources at hand. So I won't go into, like, and list all of the resources, but for me specifically in my research, these are all the core services that I have been able to utilize in my last year and a half there. Um, so as you can see, I've used cores at the Broad Institute, at the Koch Institute, at Mass General Hospital, and also at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, which was a great resource if you are working with patient samples, whether they're from biopsy or to develop organoids. So before I delve into my research, I'll just give a little background about myself. I did my Bachelor's of Science in Life Sciences here in Riyadh at the Faisal um, University. Um, and then during my last two years as undergrad and also a year after um, graduating, I worked at KFSH as a research technician. And then after that, I went and I did my PhD at MD Anderson Cancer Center where I studied cancer biology. So during my PhD, I focused on pancreatic cancer because there wasn't and still is, there isn't really any good treatments for it, and the survival expectancy is less than five years. And so even after finishing my PhD, I decided to continue studying pancreatic cancer at MIT. So I'll talk a little bit about one of my projects so far. Um, so the reason I chose uh, pancreatic cancer is that at the time of diagnosis, when a patient finally goes to a doctor, you can see that 55% of patients, the tumor has already metastasized and gone into different parts of the body. And among those, like only 35% can actually have surgery to resect the tumor. So a total of 83% of patients uh, looks pretty dismal. You can give them chemotherapy, but you know the life expectancy, is, like I said, will be less than five years. And this is strange because across all different pancreatic cancer tumors, the genes that are mutated are pretty much the same. So you'd think that we would have something to target these genes and these mutations by now. But unfortunately, we don't. So for my project, instead of focusing on the DNA, I am focusing on the RNA. So even though these tumors have the same genetic mutations, the gene, the genes that are expressed, or like the group of genes that are expressed, are actually different from patient to patient. And they're different within one tumor, depending on where in the tumor you're looking at. So there are a lot of papers um, here color-coded by different colors. 
that looked into the different RNA states of pancreatic tumors. And basically, you can see that they all pretty much give two categories that can be a classical gene signature or a basal gene signature. Why this is important is that it actually has a prognostic relevance. So you can see patients that have a higher proportion of cells that are in the basal state do much worse than people who have um, mostly tumor cells that are in the classical state. And this translates to how they respond to chemotherapy. So um, just a note, all of this data that has been published has been done using bulk RNA sequencing. Um, our lab works primarily with single cell RNA sequencing. And the difference is that with bulk, you're taking all of the RNA that's in a bunch of cells from your tumor sample, and then you're averaging out the gene expression. So if you have one cell that expresses a gene and another one that doesn't, exp uh, that doesn't express it, you're gonna get an expression score somewhere in the middle. So it's hiding a lot of data and, and diversity. So in my lab, we use, like I said, single cell um, RNA sequencing, and we were able to find a third subcategory, which we call the IC state, which is intermediate co-expressor. So this shows that there are cells that are somewhere between the basal and the classical lines. And if you wanted to like score them, like how strong is a cell going towards the basal or the classical uh, line, you can see it's actually a very, continu like a very continuous uh, picture. This means that cells can actually shift from one state to the other. So my question was, can we shift cells from the more aggressive basal type and push them towards classical so that they're sensitive to chemotherapy and then the patients will have a better overall survival prognostic? And to do that, we need to figure out what determines whether a cell goes this way or that. So in terms of genetics and in also in terms of the tumor microenvironment. So I won't go too much into detail about, um, about like the project, but basically what we're trying to do is to look at different transcription factors which regulate the gene expression in these cells and look at different small molecules and ligands that are around the tumor in the tumor microenvironment to see which of those determines whether a cell goes one way or another. And after we do that, we can actually develop better models to screen drugs, because as you all know, a lot of the preclinical experimentation does not get translated well into the clinic. And this is one of the reasons. So, so first we started with a few transcription factors here. I thought this had a, I'll just point here. Okay, so basically we took a bunch of cell lines. We took cell lines that were either basal, classical, or neither, and we also did some work with pancreatic organoids from patients. And we would either overexpress uh, GFP control or different transcription factors. We would then use something uh, called SQL, which is an in-house uh, method that we developed in the lab for single cell RNA sequencing. And then we would look whether the states of the cells have changed. So long story short, if you can focus just on panel B here, I've, uh, I've separated each of these subpanels into, uh, depending on whether the cell lines were originally classic, classical or basal or nothing. So here we have three cell lines that originally they were not classical, they were not basal, they were neither. So you can see that there isn't really much difference. But if you look at here with the classical lines, if you look at the green dots, so these are control cells that just have GFP. When we overexpress GATA6, which is co uh, colored here in blue, you can see it becomes more classical. But if we overexpress um, TP63 alpha, it becomes more basal. And we see the same thing with our basal lines. So here we found two candidate genes that we can overexpress and we can then determine how we want the cells to behave. So that was a great pilot. And now we're doing the same for over 3,000 transcription factors and epigenetic factors. And we're currently working on this, um, on this pipeline here. So this hopefully will give us an, an entire list that we will then be able to target either, um, either genomically or genetically or pharmacologically. And hopefully that would improve at, down the line how patients respond. The ultimate goal would be to convert all of the basal cells to classical cells, and then we can hit those with chemotherapy because those cells are responsive to chemotherapy. So that's it for my very short talk about my uh, actual work, but I would like to focus on the impact that the Ibn Khaldun Fellowship has had on my life in different aspects. 
So in terms of uh, my career, it was a great way to meet a lot of new people from different uh, walks of life. So I've never met, you know, uh, material scientists or chemical engineers or computer scientists before because I was pretty much in my own little bubble of genetics and biology and tumor uh, and tumor biology. So this was a great way to meet a lot of new people, form uh, very, you know, beneficial contacts and share information and ideas. Uh, I've talked with a few fellows who work primarily with AI and healthcare, which is great because they wanted someone who understood biology and I needed someone who understood AI and healthcare. And hopefully once I come back, we will be able to work together. We also exchanged a lot of information and support. For example, um, the Ibn Rushd uh, postdoctoral fellowship offered by KAUST. So I heard about that through the other fellows and uh, a number of us applied and we helped each other during the application application process and thankfully we were accepted um, and of, of course uh, the most thing that we care about <laughs> is publications and one of my projects that I'm working uh, right now on is uh, um, we got the reviewer comments and we're hopefully going to resubmit uh, next month to Nature Biotechnology um, and then finally um, my PI is very much into outreach and so uh, thanks to him I've joined the Human Cell Atlas program which is a uh, based in the UK, but they perform uh, conferences and symposiums all around the world. So last year they did uh, a symposium in Africa, and this year they're going to target the Middle East, and uh, it's gonna be virtual, but I will be talking uh, as one of the speakers about single cell uh, technologies. Um, in terms of my professional uh, you know, benefic benefit from the program is I did want to learn a new skill set. Um, so I come from a very basic biology background and don't really know that much about computational biology or coding or using R, which is very important in now and now in our like current day and age. So through the Broad Institute where I work, I was able to join a computational uh, boot camp. It's it was uh, three weeks all day, very intensive uh, workshop where they'll give you a crash course on machine learning, AI, coding with Python, coding with R, like anything you can think of. Um, and the great thing about it was we would have to also do group projects and they deliberately made the groups so that each group would have one scientist, one computer scientist, one clinician, and one sci uh, and uh, another person who is a computational biologist because we all think very differently and usually in the real world, scientists and clinicians tend to clash just because the way they approach a problem is very different. So this was also a very important uh, learning lesson for me on how we can all collaborate and work together. Um, in terms of technical skills, um, I was able to master four different types of single cell library preparations. And as you can see, that's important because um, as you see here in the last few years, these are the number of publications using single cell technology. And they have been on an exponential increase, most of which is the Chromium, which is, the 10, which is from 10X Genomics, which thankfully um, I am now comfortable using after, again, a crash course in the last two months. So I think this will really benefit me scientifically and in my career moving forward with my research. Finally, in terms of leadership, um, one of the great programs offered by MIT and also, you know, uh, Barbara and Dorothy will always tell us about these programs, is the Kaufman Teaching Certificate Program that's given to us by MIT. So it's a few months long with classes almost every week that talks about evidence-based teaching, whether it's for undergraduate or graduate courses. And um, it was very intensive and it opened my eyes to really everything that goes into being an instructor and a, and a professor. And it was great because we were able to also apply everything we learned in like micro teaching sessions. And uh, we do get like certified by the chancellor and the program director that we are able to now like teach effectively. Within the Shaley Lab, we have like a mentoring program. So every postdoc will be paired with either uh, junior postdocs, techs, or PhD students to mentor them, whether it's academically uh, or supervisor project, or just to guide them in terms of their career, right? like for example, writing grants, applying for their next job, and so on and so forth. And I'm, I currently have five mentees, and um, I appreciate their patience with me at the beginning. And so, yeah, it was definitely a great learning experience for me, and I'm very proud of all of them. 
Um, I was also talking with Dorothy about this earlier today, uh, the exposure that I was able to get through the <laughs> through the Ibn Khaldun Fellowship, because because your CACS is a very important entity here in Saudi Arabia, and MIT is also an important entity, so it definitely turns heads. And uh, these are things that have been brought to my attention by other people other than, other than myself. So I was applying to change my visa last week, and I had to get the address of Al Faisal University. And I found that on Google, they had me listed as a notable alumni, which was like, I was very happy about that. <laughs> and then my other friend also sent me the screenshot from the Al Faisal's Instagram page over the National Day where they were, had a campaign celebrating um, former alumni, and they had featured me. Again, I did not know about this. And I uh, also thank the fellowship for using a picture of me and my lab mate, Daniela, for promoting uh, the current uh, application cycle for Ibn Khaldun Fellowship. And last but not least, I was contacted uh, by the alumni relations at Al Faisal to be part of a uh, book project collaboration called Those Who Inspire. And it's basically um, an entity that goes around to different countries in the world and to talk to different people, spe specifically those who are millennials and Gen X, to, I mean Gen Z, for mentoring opportunities and also to highlight and showcase and have a way for everyone to be accessible to each other. And so I was nominated as a candidate for it. And um, I said I would be interested. Um, I was also instructed to talk about how some how are some of the difficult things that I had and how I overcame them. So for me, my my main concern was I thought one year would be too too short, especially for biology majors. You know, like our cells die, our mice die, and I just it's not really as fast paced as I think some of the com more computational or chemical uh, projects. But so that's why I was really happy when uh, Ibn Khaldun's fellowships have now an offer to extend for another year. Um, as I mentioned, uh, getting training on all of the machines and core facilities that I needed and access to all of the buildings took around three months for me before I could actually start working. Um, but I think the main difficulty for me was jumping into a new field of study. Like I said, I come from a very basic background and I just dove into something very computational. So the learning curve was, uh, was very steep, uh, but very beneficial. Any other problems I had uh, were swiftly and very efficiently <laughs> and very positively dealt with by Dorothy, Teresa, and Barbara. Um, I think they're one of the best things about the entire <laughs> fellowship. So thank you for always listening to all of my problems and my hysterics. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge everyone in my lab. So um, names that are in bold are people who have helped me but are no longer in the lab. Um, and then also all of the funding resources on your right, and especially the Ibn Khaldun Fellowship for allowing me to have this experience. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Uh, hello, my name is Jude Bandarasiri. Um, I'm currently in high school, but uh, I haven't gotten to the level where I can get into the Ibn Khaldun Fellowship Program. Uh, however, I'm already working on some research, and I have been since uh, like August. I went to the University of Petrol to work on uh, some research. Um, first, I'd like to thank you so much for this. It's really inspiring seeing another woman in STEM. This is amazing. Um, but for my question is uh, a difficulty that I've been like uh, going through in my research is uh, you've mentioned there's a gap between AI and biology and how you needed to learn about AI to continue your research. Yeah, uh, it's kind of the opposite for me. I'm working on uh, like it's a coincidence, but I'm also working on pancreases. I'm working on artificial pancreases mm -hmm. uh, and fuzzy controllers. Uh, however, there is this gap because I'm working towards uh, helping the management of diabetes. Mm -hmm. So um, collecting the data sets for diabetes and uh, the different kinds of uh, things I can implement uh, has been a difficult thing for me, especially like making the data set uh, from one code to another and different programs. So can you please uh, walk me through how uh, collecting these data sets went and uh, especially in the medicine field? 
Yeah, no, that's a great question. And honestly, you're the ones that's inspiring me, mashallah. <laughs> um, yes. So for me, the computational work that I do is not so deep into AI generation. It's more of using computational tools to analyze biological data. So for us, uh, the biological data would be deposited. Um, there are central like, da databases, for example, for biology and cancer biology. You have the TCGA, you have different universities that deposit everything. And then in all of the scientific papers you read, the, the authors are required to deposit any information that they have from their analysis, and then there's a link to it. The problem for us is the same thing that you struggle with, is each paper, each group, will analyze it a different way using a different uh, you know, coding program or different types of analyses and trying to kind of merge them all together, even between the among the computational biologists in my lab is like a daunting task and no one wants to do it. <laughs> um, but I think for like in your case, how to manage it would be, as I said, like maybe try going through different uh, scientific papers that deal with this. Maybe, maybe not exactly in diabetes, but something similar or something related to the pancreas or in your field of study, because these papers will often kind of see something done and applied in a different uh, field, but then they'll try to optimize it and apply it to their field. So you might find your answer in a paper that does not work on diabetes at all or on artificial uh, pancreas but it, it might be a paper about heart disease, for example, but you would be able to apply it onto your, your data set. Um, but actually what you're saying is very interesting because uh, we had that dinner for all the Ibn Khaldun uh, f uh, like fellows a couple of days ago, and I met someone who was, like, uh, who was similar to you. So her background was mostly computational. And when she did her Ibn Khaldun fellowship, she went into a more biology basic biology lab and she said that was a very good experience um i'm sure dorothy can give you her information um dr uh, hala i think um if there's anything else or if you want to talk more please feel free to talk to me after thank you so much any other questions yeah okay Yeah, maybe I'll follow up on Jude's uh, question. Um, yeah, can you hear? Yeah, so, uh, you know, in many applications, when we collect data, mm. you know, the data has uncertainties with it. And so just my question is, uh, how do we handle that in the applications that you mentioned, you know, in uh, taking the data that has variation in it, and then when we make sense out of it in some way, and then make a statement based on that data that is uncertain. So that means the, the message or the uh, uh, recommendation or so that comes out of that also has uh, uh, like uncertainty mm -hmm. in it. So uh, how do you guys handle this uncertainty aspect in the collection and then also in the prediction? Yeah. Um, in terms of collection, we have collaborators over at Dana Farber Cancer Institute um, with the surgeons there. So we do get uh, samples from the pancreatic tumor. And then what we do is we will establish them as patient derived organoids and culture them. And then we will we would uh, use those as samples for our RNA sequencing. That would be one thing. The second thing is we would also analyze published data from, from cell lines, or we would generate our own, and we would try to see the extent of consistency or not, ev even though they're two different models. But after anything computational we do, we always validate it biologically. So if we have a prediction, uh, like for example, some of the genes I talked about were, were predicted from all of our analyses, but then we went ahead and like applied it with organoids and with cell lines to see if we can recapitulate it. Because if it's not validated, then we kind of throw it away. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wala, for uh, such excited journey and sharing your experience in the program. Now, uh, please allow me to extend a sincere welcome to the Ibn Khaldun team from MIT, uh, Teresa and Dorothy, uh, your guidance on how to apply to the program uh, will be invaluable to all uh, our future fellows. The floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Naha. Can somebody give me a thumbs up? How's my mic doing? Can you hear me? Excellent. Uh, thank you all for your help. <laughs> um, so, hi everyone. My name is Teresa Wirth. Uh, it's been my pleasure to work with the Ibn Khaldun program for the last 10 years. It has been my pleasure to meet, recruit, support, and uh, be inspired by over 50 Saudi ladies who have come through our program to work at MIT over the years. Uh, today, I hope to share a little bit about how you might get involved in our program. And hopefully throughout today's agenda, you've seen just how there will be so many more new opportunities in the kingdom uh, so that wherever you are in your career, it's a great time to uh, invest in yourself and invest in research here in Saudi. Uh, so. Without further ado, today I'm going to share a little bit with you about the history of the Ibn Khaldun program, a little bit about MIT that uh, will maybe fill in what you've heard so far, give you an overview of the fellowship program, talk a little bit about how to apply, most important, and then at the end we'll have time where you can ask any questions of any of our speakers from today. So as I said, Ibn Khaldun has been a part of the collaboration between Saudi and MIT for many years. We actually began out of the collaboration between MIT and KFUPM. For many years, we had a joint center around the areas of research in clean water and clean energy. And with that program, you know, at the time, KFUPM was only for men. Uh, so MIT said, well, what can we do so that this can also support the Saudi women? Uh, since MIT is also for men and for women. And so they were able to give us the space and the funding to uh, pilot this program, which we are still eternally grateful for. Uh, from that uh, early success, our program was expanded through collaboration with Saudi Aramco. They actually sponsored 25 fellows over five years. Um, and most recently in 2018, we were very pleased to partner with CAXT um, and have the opportunity to extend this until at least 2028 at MIT. So uh, wherever you are, hopefully we will be here for you when you're ready to join. And just to share a little bit of background about uh, what it is like to be at MIT. So over the last couple of years, we went through a, a self-reflective exercise to try and define what is it that we are and what is it that we value at MIT? So the first area that we identified is excellence and curiosity. So at MIT, we hope that everyone will have the opportunity, the support and the community to reach their own highest potential, but also to uh, investigate their research and their projects to be an excellent project as well. And we feel that the heart of what drives everyone towards these goals is this curiosity. How can we answer this question that nobody has been able to answer before or develop this uh, product or idea that uh, we think could work, but we don't know yet and we want to know? Uh, this is something that I think really ties everyone together at MIT, even myself, who is an administrator. I get excited by these ideas. The second is openness and respect. I think Dr. Dr. Noha actually said this very nicely, um, where we at Ibn Khaldun, we see this as an opportunity to uh, collaborate and to share knowledge. So it is not about me or you or MIT or, or CACS. It's about what we can achieve together. Um, and you have to be open to do that. You have to bring people in, bring in new ideas. And um, that's really important to us at MIT. And that won't work unless there is mutual respect, respect for different positions, whether it's students, staff, faculty, different disciplines, different nationalities. This is all very important to us. 
And finally is uh, belonging and community. So we are a very international university, people from all different nationalities, backgrounds, uh, many different generations, all under one place. So we hope that everyone who comes to uh, MIT will find their home within the MIT community. So for uh, individuals like yourself, there are actually many Saudis at MIT, not just through our program, and a thriving Muslim community on campus. Uh, we have a Muslim Student Association who hosts activities throughout the year and are really a great support for the community. There's also prayer spaces on campus, these types of things. So. Uh, should you come to MIT, inshallah, I think you will find uh, that you have a home there as well. So uh, those who come through the Ibn Khaldun program are full members of our community while they are on campus. So that includes access to all of our research facilities. Uh, Dr. Rubala has already given a, a nice sense of how that might work in a particular discipline. So just to say at MIT, the individual faculty will have their own research labs where they may have specialized equipment to do their research. There are also a number of shared facilities. So we heard a lot about biology. So I'll just highlight things like um, maker spaces, if you're trying to build a prototype, 3D printing. Um, and this photo here is of our newest uh, facility, which is called MIT Nano. This is for micro nano fabrication. Uh, so where, whatever your field, we hope you will find everything you need in order to do your research at MIT. So just to build on what Dr. Kamau was saying about the area around MIT. So there are over 40 colleges and universities in the Boston area, uh, as well as many companies who maybe not even their, maybe their headquarters are in Boston, but they'll have research and development development centers in the area in order to make use of these collaborations between uh, industry and uh, academia. So this makes this opportunity, not just a great opportunity to meet with MIT, but potentially to meet with other collaborators, whether it's an industry and other universities, um, et cetera. Um, and within that too, we sort of, we have a joke at MIT that coming to MIT sometimes can be like trying to drink from a fire hose. There's so much that you can do. It's hard to decide what to pick. Um, and this environment I think contributes to this too. So whether it's at MIT or one of our neighbors, there are so many seminars and workshops and conferences happening. And we hope that anyone who comes to MIT will make the best use of this within their own uh, interest and discipline. So what is the Ibn Khaldun Fellowship Program? So this program is for Saudi lady PhDs to come to MIT and do postdoctoral resource, research. The, the uh, initial phase is for one year and there's possibility to extend to two years as well. So the heart of this is really the opportunity to do hands-on research um, in a lab with an MIT faculty member. So as Dr. Wella shared, uh, you know, you don't just come to MIT and you're all alone. You'll get matched with a faculty member. You'll be a part of their lab working with all different uh, levels of researchers from faculty, other postdocs, graduate students, undergraduate researchers. So um, you have this uh, diverse uh, community and support to work with. We spoke a little bit about the facilities and uh, uh, professional development. So uh, we'll actually talk a little bit about that, uh, more about that soon. So those of us here from MIT are actually all uh, representing the Department of Mechanical Engineering. So this is my opportunity to highlight that this program is not just for mechanical engineers, so we've actually hosted fellows in over 20 departments at MIT, uh, everything from architecture to chemistry to Sloan School of Business, Media Lab. So any discipline where there is active research at MIT is an appropriate match for the fellowship program. So even if within this very long list, you don't necessarily see your discipline, 
go learn about more at MIT, you will find there's so much happening in so many different areas. It's likely that uh, you will find a match for yourself as well. Um, so we talked a little bit about doing joint research with our faculty. We've been very pleased to see that many of our fellows have had amazing success in publishing in uh, peer-reviewed journals and also being accepted to uh, prestigious conferences in their fields. Uh, just to talk a little bit more about professional development, uh, in addition to the teaching program that Devala has already shared, we have an MIT professional education program. It's really designed around these short courses to teach you in depth about different uh, technical capabilities uh, that you may or wish to gain while you're at MIT. And really, we, we encourage everyone who comes through the program to think about, you know, the research is the heart, but there's a lot more to being a su successful in your career than just the research, whether it's uh, presentation skills or uh, entrepreneurship, um, teaching, all of that comes together into you and your career. So whatever you think you might want to emphasize while you're at MIT, that's where my colleagues Dorothy, Barbara, and also Isabel can help you uh, think about how to use your time. Uh, we also have an executive education program through our MIT Sloan School. Uh, many of our fellows have gone through this program to learn about innovation and uh, different ways of, of thinking with uh, more broadly about how to utilize and apply the learning in the lab. Um, and I think Kamal has done a great job talking about the overall entrepreneurship ecosystem, uh, which really is for the researchers too, even if you've never done anything in entrepreneurship before, but you think, wow, I have an idea that could really go to the marketplace. There's so much support at MIT that you would be able to utilize as well. So now I'd like to invite my colleague, Dorothy Hanna, to come to the stage. So uh, while I have the pleasure of staying involved with this program, Dorothy is really the boss. Um, if you come through this program, you will be working with her and our team. And so she would like to share a little bit more with you now. Thank you, Teresa. It is a pleasure to be here with all of you today. And I'm going to go quite quickly through my slides so that we have more time for Q&A at the end. Uh, one of the important parts of our program is building community. The, we're so proud, actually, of the network of fellows and how they all support each other and collaborate, and we hope that for all of you. So these are some of the fun events that we do to help build those connections. You've heard about MIT and its location within Boston. We do want to encourage you, if you have kids that you should not be afraid to apply. There's lots of great resources for kids in Boston and uh, in Cambridge, specifically where MIT is, and lots of great resources all around MIT in Cambridge and the Boston area. OK, you're thinking, great, I want to do it. Do I qualify? Uh, I always say, if you're a Saudi Arabian woman, good job. You're already like halfway there. There's not. So many of you in the room today, it's more of a mixed bag. So, um, but those of you who already meet that criteria, good job. To thrive at MIT, you need to speak English well, have a demonstrated ability to conduct research, uh, match with an MIT faculty in one of our many, many departments, but you have to have a good match to qualify. And you need to have completed your PhD within six years of the start date which is September 1st, 2024. So what makes a strong application? Be like Dr. Willa. Uh, we want to see what the impact of your current research is, what you've already added to the scientific knowledge of our world. Even if you work on a team, think about how you can communicate what you added. And one important aspect of this is your recommendation letters. Uh, we are looking for recommendation letters from people who really know your research and your skill set. Um, maybe you know somebody really important, like the dean of your college, and they'll say something nice about you, but they don't know who you are as a researcher. It's more important to find a colleague who could actually talk about your skill set. Okay. 
We also want to know, what do you plan to do at MIT? What is your idea? How do you think you can add something to the lab and the research group that you join? Uh, we ask you to research and find faculty members who are in appropriate field for you, that you're really interested in working with them, and that you think that you can add something exciting and in your collaboration develop something new together that might not have been thought of otherwise. And if you want to in your application say, you know, if I'm in Dr. Dorothy's lab, I might do this. If I'm in Dr. Teresa's lab, I might do that. If I'm in Dr. Kamal's lab, I might do that. Um, that's a good way to help us show that what you're thinking. And we do have the faculty that you list read your application if possible. So you think about your audience. The people you're talking about working with are actually going to be reading it and saying, you know, do I think this is a good fit for me? You can apply online. Uh, in addition to the online application, you will need your CV, a PDF copy of your most significant publication. And after you submit the form, there will be a new form that pops up where you can put in the information for your recommenders. Make sure that you hit the green send email button or they won't get an email. And bookmark the page so you can come back later and see if their letters have been uploaded to our website. So they'll be sent directly to us via our website rather than sending it to you and then you sending it to us. The deadlines are November 20th for the online application and December 1st for the letters of recommendation. And the journey, once you apply, uh, your application will be reviewed both by a team at MIT and separately by a team at CAXT. Then we get together and decide on the top candidates and we do uh, video interviews with the top candidates. We make decisions in January and our goal is always to send acceptance letters in February. And then people say, Will I get to meet with my faculty before I'm matched? Yes. We work with you during the spring to match people with a really strong uh, faculty who will help support you in your research and you will feel like you have a strong contribution to make. In the summer is for paperwork and finally September 1st arrive and start to get to know your lab. Behind the scenes, we encourage questions. We love to answer your questions and help support you and uh, myself, Barbara, and Isabel are behind the scenes answering your emails. And finally, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. This is a very exciting time for us to see uh, who you are and what you're thinking about, how we can work with you on the application process. And uh, we're fortunate to have three fellows here with us today. So I'm going to come down here and we'll do Q&A a little bit cozier. So if you're feeling like it's too far away, you can move forward too if you want. But I invite uh, Dr. Sufana, Dr. Seba, and Dr. Wala, as well as Professor Kamal and Teresa to join me for Q&A. We'll even walk even closer so you don't feel scared of us. <laughs> what questions do you have? I went through it so quickly, so you should still have things you're wondering about how to apply. And these are the experts. You know, they applied, they succeeded, they came, they endured the struggles of moving to another country. I covered everything perfectly. Um, we'll wrap it up then because we're getting close to the end of the time, but please come up and ask us questions individually as well. We're very happy to answer your questions. So. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. We appreciate the chance to be here. Well, that wraps up our session today. And we also would like to express our sincere gratitude to all the speakers who have shared their insights and knowledge with us today. Uh, to our participants and guests, thank you for your active engagement and thoughtful contributions throughout the session. As we conclude this session, let us carry forward 
the knowledge gained today and the connections made. And let us also continue to foster international collaborations, prioritize national efforts, mutual innovation ecosystem, and seize the opportunities uh, presented by the Eben Khaldun Fellowship Program. Thank you once again for being part of this uh, session today, and we wish you continued success. Thank you.